On a warm day in October of 2011, Josh Williams and Philip Porter came out to Cosmo Park here in Columbia, Missouri around the noon hour. What they had planned on doing was enjoying a few beers before the dwindling days of amicable weather faded into the cold of a Missouri fall. What they encountered, however, according to them and their attorney, was an overzealous officer who would turn them into the guinea pigs of a police training exercise. Stephen Weiss, the attorney representing the men in this case, formerly worked as a military police sergeant in the United States Army, holding positions in the patrol unit, on a drug suppression team, as a customs investigator and inspector, and as a machine gun squad leader in a strategic MP unit. He has also served as a special municipal prosecutor. The officers were out at the park doing motorcycle training, uh, how, to, how to handle their bikes, how to maneuver their bikes. So I see some lights, I didn't really know what it was because it was three officers and it was all lined up, you know what I mean? It is likely that they were, because they were in that, you know, simulated mode there, that they said, well, let's just stretch this over in the real world. Hey, there's something suspicious, let's go roll upon it. When they first gave you commands, put your hands up. I was still trying to figure out what they were saying. All right, let's treat this like it's a high-risk traffic stop. Went to turn the music down, that's when the guns were dropped. They pulled the guns out and said, it's not worth it. If you're just a couple guys sitting in the park and all of a sudden you've got police yelling, don't do it, it's not worth it, it can be pretty terrifying. Forget the music. <laughs> and I put my hands up. I ain't want to die. thought I was going to die. They had no basis to roll up with guns out at people for listening to music in the park. Music, they say, wasn't being played. When they pulled me out the car, they had the gun on my head as they pulling me out the car. They said they pulled their guns out because we weren't following their commands. Yeah. My question is, why were we even given commands to put our hands up? What did we do? I mean, when they arrested Josh for, for violating no law, I, I think they went too far. There was no robbery in the area. There was no reason or probable cause for them to give us commands, put your hands up. And then he put my hands behind my back. And then he slammed me up against the car. If they were arresting him for a felony, uh, then they securing him with cuffs is reasonable. Um, but they, but frankly, they had no basis to arrest him. I never resisted arrest. I just did everything they told me to do. I didn't resist, put up a fight. I didn't do anything. The Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution ensures citizens the right against unreasonable searches and seizures by government officials. The amendment sets a standard that probable cause must exist before any searches or seizures occur. What that means is that if an individual refuses to allow an officer the right to search his home or vehicle, that officer must be able to articulate what criminal activity they believe was occurring or had occurred and how the search was related to said criminal activity in order to legally execute the search. They never asked me to search my car. They never said anything about they had a reason to search my car. Well, I think they asked, do you have guns or drugs in the car? And he was upfront and honest about it. So yeah, I got, I got a gun in the car, it's registered. They just did a full search of my car, popped my trunk. And they didn't find anything else, um, and they, but they did find the gun that he told them about. I feel like a convenience store clerk that just got robbed. It was just that feeling. Mr. Williams also believed that the media's reporting of the incident swayed public opinion against him. KMIZ in the Tribune, I, re I was reading a lot of the comments, and people think that I deserve what I got because I had a firearm and I had a couple beers. So I deserved to die because I had a firearm and a couple beers. My beers weren't even open. I wish the news would have said that. That these men weren't drunk, the beers weren't open, and my, and my 40 cal was locked in my glove box. During the incident, Mr. Williams suffered an injury to his arm, resulting in a trip to the hospital for the Columbia man. The sergeant told me that from the handcuffs, I told him I couldn't feel my thumb. And he said sometimes when the handcuffs go on, Sometimes it happens. I no. waited that night to see if it got any better. It didn't, so I went to the hospital that following day. Well, he's had to get treatment. He's had to go to the doctor. He's had to wear a cast, I mean, a, a brace. Um, you know, there are some ongoing treatment issues that uh, you know may that could still impact his life, and he may have to go get surgery because what what would happen? You know, that's if that's the case, that's pretty significant. They told me I had a fracture. They told me I got a chip bone. They said that it was sprung. They said that, you know, they want to put me in a splint. Now they want to put me in a full cast. And if the full cast doesn't work, they want to do a surgery to remove the bone. But what reasoning was given to explain the actions of CPD? They're saying, well, someone told me that he had a felony conviction. 
the official records might indicate he had a felony conviction. They have, you know, they have access to database information. It's a lot more accurate than that. Mr. Williams, however, proposed a different hypothesis. I'm going through all this pain, all this, all this, because I was black and sitting in the park in Columbia. We may have to figure out who at the department, yeah. if someone at the department actually gave incorrect information. If they say, well, we'll just arrest him and we'll find something in his vehicle that justifies another arrest. In an attempt to figure out what had happened and why, Mr. Williams promptly filed a complaint with the police department and requested any footage or audio documentation they had of the incident. When I made the complaint to the captain, he told me that uh, motorcycle cops don't have videos, but they got audio. And then a few days later, I asked him if he had got that, uh, that audio of what happened. He told me they had parts of the audio. Jeff Jones. It was I Jeff. Yeah. The captain or some shit got his own office in the back at the police station. Did he give you an explanation for why it was just parts of the audio? No, nah, he didn't give me an explanation. But even the audio that the department recovered would prove virtually useless. Whenever uh, they finally got the audio to my lawyer, my lawyer told me that it sounds like in the audio that they started recording after they had put the guns to me, after I had told them about my wrist. And uh, it's a little suspicious. Because in the, in, the, in the report, the police document, it said he turned on his mic as soon as he pulled up to us. It's tough being a good cop. It's tough being a good cop. It really is. There's a lot of stress. And you got to deal with a lot of, you know, BS. Uh, but frankly, it is a noble profession if you do it well. I understand adrenaline mistakes, but there's a difference between adrenaline mistakes and, you know, just plain lawlessness. Click the link on the screen or in the description for part two, where we look into the past of the officers involved, interview a park ranger who was a partial witness to the incident, and get an update on the lawsuit against the Columbia Police Department.